Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Ruskies and Reads. Thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me for a little bit. I'm so grateful that you are here. Today we are here to talk about some notable new releases for the month of September. So I'm gonna be really honest and when I was doing the research for this video there were not a whole lot of releases that I was crazy excited for in the month of September. This list does include some of those books but it primarily also includes books that I think you will actually be really interested in or there are quite a few sequels coming out to books that you may have already read that I think you will want to know about so those are included in here as well. I do still have about 20 new releases to talk to you about and it does seem like we are now getting to that point of the year where all of the holiday romance books are coming out so very briefly at the end of this video I'm going to run through a handful that are coming out in September. I'm not going to say anything about them because you know they're holiday romances. I think we all know what they're about and how they are going to end but I'm just going to quickly bring them to your attention in case you are interested and are going to start collecting those for the holiday season. So without further ado let's go ahead and just jump right in. Also I will give you a quick caveat here that some of these new releases you will have heard me talk about in the recent book of the month prediction video that I put out. If I can I'm going to try not to like read these synopses again or talk about them too terribly much because I did talk about them them in that video but some of the synopses I just like really don't remember they haven't stuck with me so I may go ahead and read them again. Again that is just to give you an idea of what the books are about so you can make the decision on whether or not you feel they are interesting enough to add to your TBR. Starting with the very first Tuesday in the month of September which is the 5th we have a very highly anticipated release by a lot of people and that is The River We Remember by William Kent Kruger. This is definitely a strong contender for a book of the month prediction and it was featured in that video and it is actually set in 1950s in Minnesota and it is kind of surrounding a murder mystery where the body of a wealthy landowner named Jimmy Quinn is found floating in a river dead from a shotgun blast and the sheriff even before anything has really happened he has pegged a Native American World War II veteran named Noah Bluestone as the killer. Noah Bluestone has actually returned to the small town in Minnesota with a Japanese wife. There are a lot of suspicions surrounding him and so the sheriff Brody Dern is trying to uncover what actually happened to Quinn. He's also battling some very personal demons of his own from his military service so there's quite a lot going on in the story and it says both a complex spellbinding mystery and a masterful portrait of mid-century American life. The River We Remember is an unflinching look at the wounds left by the wars we fight abroad and at home, a moving exploration of the ways in which we seek to heal and a testament to the enduring power of the stories we tell about the places we call home. So while I do think that this is firmly in the historical fiction category, there are definitely a lot of literary fiction aspects to this as well. There is also definitely a mystery involved. I have never read a William Kent Kruger before. I know a lot of people are a big fan of This Tender Land. I've heard a lot of amazing things about that and I think I might be willing to give this one a try just because I love the synopsis of it and I really want to see kind of what comes about it. So put this on your radar for September 5th. Also coming out on the 5th is Stephen King's newest release called Holly and y'all know that I'm including this purely for your benefit because I am not a Stephen King fan. I don't read Stephen King. I have no interest in Stephen King but in case you are a big fan of his like I said his newest release is coming out on the 5th. So I'm actually not going to read the synopsis of the story because first of all it says that this is Holly Gibney number three. I think she's been featured in a few other Stephen King books before and I don't want to risk any spoilers just in case you do plan on going back and reading the other books that feature this character. But also when I was personally reading through the synopsis I think it gave a lot of weight and I feel like if you're a Stephen King fan you should just probably go into this one blind without reading the synopsis. So I don't want to give anything away about this story so I'm not going to read it but just know if you are a Stephen King fan this one does come out on the 5th. Another sequel that comes out on the 5th is Things We Left Behind by Lucy Score. This is the third in her Knock Em Out series. I do believe that these are all companion novels so you really don't need to read one before the other but just in case I'm not going to read the synopsis of this. I will say that this follows characters Lucian Rollins and Sloane Walton who is apparently a feisty small town librarian so I'm kind of here for those vibes and it definitely sounds like it's going to be somewhat maybe of like a hate to love kind of romance so if you have read the other two books in this series and you have enjoyed them just know that the third book in this series comes out on the fifth. Another release that comes out on the fifth and it's one that I am personally very interested in it is another one that I put in my book of the month predictions video and I'm just loving the vibes of it so much it's called The River Runs South by Audrey Ingram. So this follows our main character Camille Taylor. She had a successful career in Washington DC. I believe she was an attorney of some kind and then she unexpectedly loses her husband. And so she is struggling for about a year and she decides to take her daughter to her hometown in Alabama. I believe in the Mobile area. And when she gets back to her hometown she realizes that things there have changed. She meets this local fisherman named Mac Phillips and Mac Phillips tells her that there is some runoff from an abandoned development site that is polluting the water and he has brought suit against the owners of this site. And the owner of that site just 
happens to be Camille's father. So Camille actually takes up her father's defense. She joins his defense team and she is kind of going to fight the lawsuit. And soon as she starts to learn more and more about what's happening, she starts to wonder if she's actually really on the wrong side of this fight. And naturally she also starts to kind of develop feelings for Mac. So you're definitely going to find her struggling with protecting her family, protecting her father, but also the feelings that she has for Mac and the negative impact she knows that her father's development site is having on the local environment and the water and things like that. Absolutely everything about this story really appeals to me. So I'm getting some Kristen Hanna vibes in the way that this is going to be written, but also like mixed with an Aaron Brockovich type storyline. And I am 100% here for it. I think that this has just officially become like one of my most anticipated releases, not just for September, but the rest of the year. I do believe that this is a debut novel and I'm excited to see what Audrey Ingram can do with it. And like I said, this comes out on the 5th. Also on the 5th, we have The Long Game by Elena Armas. She wrote the Spanish Love Deception, which I know is a pretty popular, I think like hate to love, possibly fake dating kind of situation. I haven't actually read it, but I do have it on my physical TBR and I'm excited to get to it. So when I saw that she had a new release coming out in September, I wanted to mention it just in case you were a really big fan of this story. This follows main character Adeline Reyes, who has spent years perfecting her daily routine, wake up at dawn, drive to the Miami Flames FC offices, try her hardest to leave a Margot home and repeat. But her routine is disrupted when a video of her in an altercation with the team's mascot goes viral. Rather than fire her, the team's owner, who happens to be her father, sends Adeline to middle of nowhere, North Carolina, where she's tasked with turning around the struggling local soccer team, the Green Warriors, as a way to redeem herself. Her plans crumble upon discovering that the players wear tutus to practice, which are impractical, keep pet goats, and are terrified of Aelin and our nine-year-old kids. To make things worse, also in town is Cameron Caldani, goalkeeping prodigy whose presence is somewhat of a mystery. Cam is the perfect candidate to help Aelin, but after one very unfortunate first encounter involving a rooster, Cam's leg, and Aelin's bumper, he's also set on running her out of town. But banishment is not an option for Aelin. Not again. Helping this ragtag children's team is her road to redemption, and she is playing the long game with or without Cam's help. I really love the vibe that I'm getting from this story. It definitely sounds like it's going to be very cute, sweet, heartwarming. It just sounds absolutely wonderful. Like I said, I've not read the Spanish Love Deception before, but I know it's getting a lot of hype and a lot of praise. And so if I do love that, I will certainly be picking this one up as well. The fifth is a really big day for releases, y'all. We still have several more to talk about, including The Sight by Melody Golding. This is another Book of the Month prediction that I had because it would be a repeat author for Book of the Month. What I found really intriguing was that this is for fans of carnival set thrillers and who are also fans of Stranger Things. So it is Stranger Things meets a carnival set thriller. And I find that premise really, really interesting. It follows our main character, Faith, who always has had a gift in that she can kind of predict and see when people are going to die. It's not something she wants to have. She's tried to get rid of it, but she can't. She's just kind of had to learn to live with it. And in the story, she has returned home to kind of work for her family's traveling carnival. And then one day she's attacked by an unruly customer. And she actually has a vision in full view of the crowd and everybody who's watching her. And because of that, because she lost control of her ability, she is banned from the carnival. She has no source of income. And then it says, desperate to support her mother and with only one friend standing by her, she sees no reason to continue hiding her ability and goes to dangerous lengths to earn money. But when she sees herself in a man's future death, Faith must face her own fears of her powers and tune into her gift to fight against a future that would ruin her life and end someone else's. I have never read anything from this author before. If you've read her previous works and this sounds interesting to you, please keep an eye out for it. It comes out on the 5th. Another intriguing release that comes out on the 5th is called The September House by Carissa Orlando. And this is definitely a haunted house story. It follows our main character, Margaret, and her husband, Hal, who have recently bought this wonderful Victorian house for a steal of the price. So right away, you know something is wrong. But it doesn't take long for them to discover the hauntings that happen in this house. Every single September, the walls drip blood, ghosts of former inhabitants kind of roam the halls. All of these ghosts are kind of afraid of something that lurks in the basement. And so naturally you would think that Margaret and her husband would flee, but Margaret is not most people. Margaret is not going to flee. This is her dream house. She's going to stay. She's not going to be scared away. But Hal, her husband, is really not sure. And after four years, he can't take it anymore. And he kind of leaves abruptly, but nobody is able to get a hold of him. Nobody knows where he went. Nobody knows what actually happened to him. And so their daughter actually comes to try to help find Hal, but she doesn't know anything about what is going on in this house. And so as Margaret and her daughter are trying to find Hal, the hauntings kind of get worse and deep and it just sounds really sinister. It sounds like it's going to have the perfect fall spooky vibes and I'm here for it. This is a debut novel and I'm really interested to see what Carissa Orlando is going to be able to do with this because it is definitely fully speculative in nature. You don't really have to guess if it's going to be speculative in nature. You just know kind of right offhand that there are ghosts. This place is haunted. Things are going down and I'm really curious to see what she's able to do with the story. Also on the fifth we have Mother Daughter Murder Night by Nina Simon and I'm not entirely sure if this is classified as a cozy mystery but it kind of gives me cozy mystery vibes just because you have a grandmother mother daughter trio who is trying to solve a murder. It says high powered businesswoman Lana Rubicon has a lot to be proud of. Her keen intelligence, impeccable taste, and the LA real estate empire she's built. When she finds herself trapped 300 miles north of the city,
already, convalescing in a sleepy coastal town with her adult daughter Beth and teenage granddaughter Jack. Lana is stuck counting otters instead of square footage and hoping that boredom won't kill her before the cancer does. Then Jack, tiny in stature but fiercely independent, happens upon a dead body while kayaking near their bungalow. Jack quickly becomes a suspect in the homicide investigation and the Rubicon women are thrown into chaos. Beth thinks Lana should focus on recovery, but Lana has a better idea. She'll pull on her wig, find the true murderers, protect her family, and prove she still has power. With Jack and Beth's help, Lana uncovers a web of lies, family vendettas, and land disputes lurking beneath the surface of a community populated by folksy, conservationists, and wealthy ranchers. But as their amateur snooping advances into ever more dangerous territory, the headstrong Rubicon women must learn to do the one thing they've never tried, trust each other. So yes, I'm definitely getting some fun, cozy mystery vibes about a grandmother, mother, and daughter who get into some shenanigans trying to solve this murder. And it just sounds like a really good fun time. So if you're into cozy mysteries, or even if you are trying to kind of get into the mystery thriller genre, this sounds like it would be an excellent place to start because it doesn't sound like it's going to be too dark, too gritty, too gruesome, too scary, or anything like that. So this is one to keep an eye out for in September on the 5th. All right, we finally ended the 5th and now we are moving on into the 12th, starting with a book by Millie Bobby Brown. Yes, Eleven from Stranger Things has wrote a debut historical fiction novel called 19 Steps. It's 1942 and London remains under constant threat of enemy attack as the Second World War rages on. In the Bethnal Green neighborhood, Nellie Morris counts every day lucky that she emerges from the underground shelters unharmed, her loving family still surrounding her. Three years into the war, she's grateful to hold onto remnants of normalcy, her job as assisting the mayor and nights spent at the local pub with her best friend. But after a chance encounter with Ray, an American airman stationed nearby, Nellie becomes enchanted with the idea of a broader world. Just when Nellie begins to embrace an exciting new life with Ray, a terrible incident occurs during an air raid one evening, and the consequences are catastrophic. As the truth about that night is revealed, Nellie's world is torn apart. When it seems all hope is lost, Nellie finds that against all odds, love and happiness can triumph. 19 Steps is a deeply affecting, mesmerizing page turner inspired by the author's family history. An epic story of longing, loss, and secrets, Millie Bobby Brown's propulsive debut introduces an unforgettable, brave young woman and boldly portrays the strength and the power of love. So I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little bit skeptical. I would definitely be going into this one very trepidatiously. I know that sounds absolutely horrible, like I should be giving her the benefit of the doubt. I just don't know. But I really do appreciate how personal this is to Millie Bobby Brown. It is based on her own family history, and so I do think that she's probably poured a lot of her heart and soul into this story, and as a historical fiction lover, I may be willing to give it a shot, especially if I hear really good things. Early reviews are positive, but like I said, there are not many of them, so this could go either way. So I think that this is one that I'm going to kind of keep an eye out and really see what the reviews say before heading into it, but this is definitely a notable release for the 12th. Also on the 12th, we have the first book in a brand new fantasy series by Jennifer Lynn Armitrout called Fall of Ruin and Wrath. It is the first in her Awakening series, which I believe is adult or new adult, but I will have to confirm that because I'm not entirely sure. It says, long ago, the world was destroyed by gods. Only nine cities were spared. Separated by vast wilderness, teeming with monsters and unimaginable dangers, each city is now ruled by a guardian, royalty who feed on mortal pleasure. Born with an intuition that never fails, Callista knows her talents are of great value to the power hungry of the world. So she lives hidden as a courtesan of the Baron of Archwood. In exchange for his protection, she grants him information. When her intuition leads to save a traveling prince in dire trouble, the voice inside her blazes with warning and promise. Today he'll bring her joy. One day he'll be her doom. When the Baron takes an interest in the traveling prince and the prince takes an interest in Callista, she becomes the prince's temporary companion. But with mites and monsters at her city gates and a hungry prince in her bed, intuition may not be enough to keep her safe. Callista must follow her intuition to safety or follow her heart to her downfall. So we all have heard of JLA. She is a very prolific author, especially in the young adult realm. She definitely also has some very popular fantasy series. So if you are interested, this newest one is going to be released on the 12th. Also on the 12th, we have the newest release from Mona Awad called Rouge. Now I've never read anything by Mona Awad. I know that her story Bunny is a very popular dark academia that I've heard is extremely weird and I don't love weird stories. So I've never been brave enough to dive in, but I know it's very, very popular and a lot of you are fans. So like I said, her newest release comes out on the 12th. It says it's a horror tinted gothic fairy tale about a lonely dress shop clerk whose mother's unexpected death sends her down a treacherous path in pursuit of youth and beauty. For as long as she can remember, Belle has been insidiously obsessed with her skin and skincare videos. When her estranged mother, Noelle, mysteriously dies, Belle finds herself back in Southern California, dealing with her mother's considerable debts and grappling with lingering questions about her death. The stakes escalate when a strange woman in red appears at the funeral, offering a tantalizing clue about her mother's demise, followed by a cryptic video about a transformative spa experience. With the help of a pair of red shoes, Belle is lured into the barbed embrace of La Maison des Meduses, the same lavish culty spa to which her mother was devoted. There, Belle discovers the frightening secret behind her and her mother's obsession with the mirror and the great shimmering depths and demons that lurk on the other side of the glass. Snow White meets Eyes Wide Shut in this surreal descent into the dark side of beauty, envy, grief, and the complicated love between mothers and daughters. With black humor and seductive horror, Rouge explores the cult-like nature of the beauty industry as well as the danger of internalizing its pitiless gaze. Brimming with California sunshine and blood red rose petals, Rouge 
Scrooge holds up a warped mirror to our relationship with mortality, our collective fixation with the surface, and the wondrous deep longing that might lie beneath. So again, if you enjoy Mona Awad and that sounds interesting to you, that is coming out on the 12th. Another release coming out on the 12th is one that I am personally excited for. It is called Witch of Wild Things by Raquel Vesquez Gilliland. And it is following our main character, Sage Flores. She is part of a family that has been said to be cursed by the gods. So everybody has a bit of magic. And that is something that Sage herself has kind of been running from ever since her sister Sky died. But eight years later, she's kind of having to reluctantly return home. She kind of slips into old familiar comforting patterns, including working at a job called Cranberry Rose. And I guess her gift is that she actually has the ability to communicate with plants and that helps her at her job. And then it says what should be a simple task is complicated by her partner in botany sleuthing, Tennessee Reyes. He broke her heart in high school and she never truly recovered. Working together is reminding her of all their past tender genuine moments and new feelings for this mature sexy man are starting to take root in her heart. With rare plants to find, a dead sister who keeps bringing her coffee, and another sister whose anger fills the sky with lightning, Sage doesn't have time for romance. But being with Ten is like standing in the middle of a field on the cusp of a summer thunderstorm, supercharged and inevitable. So we're definitely having a little bit of witch vibes. It also sounds like we are going to get somewhat of a second chance romance. It also sounds like there could be some lighter humorous aspects to it because I love this line that says a dead sister who keeps bringing her coffee. So it sounds like she has a relationship with her dead sister Sky, who might be like a ghost just kind of hanging around. So I'm really just interested in this overall. So it has definitely been added to my TBR. And the final release coming out on the 12th that I want to talk to you about today is called Black Sheep by Rachel Harrison. I believe that this is going to be a horror type novel. Nobody has a normal family, but Vesper Wright is truly something else. Else. Vesper left home at 18 and never looked back, mostly because she was told that leaving the staunchly religious community she grew up in meant she couldn't return. But then an envelope arrives on her doorstep. Inside is an invitation to the wedding of Vesper's beloved cousin, Rosie. It's to be hosted at the family farm. Have they made an exception to the rule? It wouldn't be the first time Vesper's been given special treatment. Is the invite a sweet gesture? An olive branch? A trap? Doesn't matter. Something inside her insists she goes to the wedding, even if it means returning to the toxic environment she escaped. Even if it means reuniting with her mother, Constance, a former horror film star and forever ice queen. When Vesper's homecoming exhumes a terrible terrifying secret. She's forced to reckon with her family's beliefs and her own crisis of faith in this deliciously sinister novel that explores the way family ties can bind us as we struggle to find our place in the world. So if that sounds intriguing to you as well, comes out on the 12th. Moving on into the 19th, we have The Phoenix Crown, which is going to be written by Kate Quinn, who is one of my favorite historical fiction authors, but she's also co-authoring that with Janie Chang. It's got dual timelines where Cy Paris in 1912 and San Francisco in 1906. So at the height of an intoxicating Paris summer, a mysterious American millionaire attends a sumptuous costume ball with his bride on whom he has bestowed the legendary phoenix crown, a priceless relic of Beijing's fallen summer palace. The party of the century kicks off with 300 guests, 900 bottles of champagne, and one quest for justice that spends two continents and six years. And then you go to the past, which is San Francisco, 1906. In a bustling city of newly minted millionaires and hopeful upstarts, four very different women cross paths. A resourceful Chinatown embroideress desperately searching for her lost love, a silver-voiced soprano who performs alongside Enrico Caruso, a mysteriously disappeared artist, and an independent female botanist obsessed with collecting a rare flower that only blooms at night. One man seemingly holds the key to their question. Henry Thornton, the charming railroad magnate whose extraordinary collection of Chinese antiquities includes the Phoenix Crown. The women's lives are thrown into chaos when the San Francisco earthquake rips the city apart and Thornton disappears, leaving a mystery in his wake that reaches further than anyone could have imagined. So this definitely is a different road for Kate Quinn, who primarily writes World War II historical fiction. I'm not entirely sure yet if I'm going to pick it up because it is kind of outside of my realm of interest when it comes to to historical fiction, but I have my eye on it for sure. On the 19th, we also have an interesting thriller from Lou Burney called Dark Ride. 21 year old Hardy Hardly Reed, good natured, easygoing, usually stoned, is drifting through life. A minimum wage scare actor at an amusement park, he avoids unnecessary effort and unrealistic ambitions. Then one day he notices two children around six or seven sitting all alone on a bench. Hardly checks if they're okay and sees injuries on both children. Someone is hurting these kids. He reports the incident to CPS. That should be the end of it. After all, Hardly's not even good at looking out for himself, so the last thing he wants to do is look out for anyone else. But he's haunted by the two kids, his heartbreaking for them, and the more research he does, the less he trusts that CPS, understaffed and overworked, will do anything. That leaves him. He is probably the last person you'd ever want to count on, but those two kids have nobody else but him. Hardly has to do what's right and help them. For the first time in his life, Hardly decides to fight for something. Faced with a different version of himself than he has ever known, Hardly refuses to give up, but his commitment to saving these kids from further harm might end up getting the kids and Hardly himself killed. So that was definitely a super long synopsis, 
but it certainly has me intrigued and it is one that I will be keeping my eye out. And then the final book that I want to talk to you about today that is coming out on the 19th is called All You Have to Do is Call by Carrie Maher. This is not necessarily a historical fiction that I am particularly interested in, but I do think that it would pique a lot of my viewers' interests. It's set in Chicago in the early 1970s. Who does a girl call when she needs help? Jane. The best known secret in the city. Jane is a women's health organization composed entirely of women helping women, freeing them from the expectations of society and family. Veronica, Jane's founder, prides herself on the services she has provided to thousands of women, yet the price of others' freedom is that she leads a double life. When she's not at Jane, Veronica plays the role of conventional housewife, which becomes even more difficult during her own high-risk pregnancy. Two more women in Veronica's neighborhood are grappling with similar disconnects. Margaret, a young professor at the University of Chicago, secretly volunteers at Jane as she falls in love with a man whose attitude towards his ex-wife increasingly disturbs her. Patty, who's long been content as a devoted wife and mother, has begun to sense that something essential is missing from her life. When her runaway younger sister Eliza shows up unexpectedly, Patty is forced to come to terms with what it really means to love and support a sister. In this historic moment, when the personal was nothing if not political, when television, movies, and commercials told women they'd come a long way, baby, Veronica, Margaret, and Patty must make choices that will change the course of their lives forever. So like I said, this is not one that I am personally interested in, but I do know that it's going to intrigue a lot of historical fiction fans out there, so I wanted to mention it here. All right, and we are moving into the final Tuesday of September, which is September 26th, starting with the newest from Beth O'Leary called The Wake Up Call. This definitely sounds like it's going to be a hate to love romance. It follows two characters, Izzy and Lucas, who work for Forest Manor Hotel, which is a hotel that is literally falling apart. It's about to go under. They really don't think that it's going to survive much longer. But Izzy returns a guest's lost wedding ring and the reward she gets convinces management that this might be the way to fix everything. So apparently there are four rings still sitting in the lost and found and Izzy and Lucas have to kind of band together to find their owners and save their beloved hotel. As their bitter rivalry turns into something much more complicated, Izzy and Lucas begin to wonder if there's more at stake here than the hotel's future. Can the two of them make it through the season with their hearts intact? So this isn't really doing much for me plot wise. It definitely sounds like it's going to be light, fluffy, fun, possibly a little bit heartwarming. I'm not entirely sold on the premise because I'm not entirely sure how finding the owners of four lost wedding rings is going to possibly save their hotel, especially if the owners are not necessarily willing to give up a reward for them. So like, I'm not entirely sure how the premise of this is going to work. It doesn't really feel like anything substantial to me, but if you are a fan of Beth O'Leary, this one, like I said, comes out on the 26th. Another one coming out on the 26th that I'm not going to say pretty much anything about is the next in the Cormoran Strike series by Robert Galbraith, AKA JK Rowling, called The Running Grave. So if you are a fan of the series, if you have been reading it and you are interested in the next release, again, that one comes out on the 26th. Another notable release coming out on the 26th that I know a lot of people are really hyped for is the newest release by B.E. Schwab called The Fragile Threads of Power, which I believe is kind of like a sequel spinoff series to the Darker Shade of Magic series. This is another one that I don't really want to read too much into because I believe it is going to follow some characters from the original trilogy and I don't want to risk any types of spoilers for those who have not read the original trilogy. But for those of you who are fans of V.E. Schwab, who are fans of this series, this one is certainly one to keep your eye out for on September 26th. And the final book that I want to talk to you about today is another kind of haunted house-esque type of story. It is called The Stranger Upstairs by Lisa M. Matlin. This is another book of the month prediction that I have and I would love to see it. So whereas first I talked about the September house, which is definitely speculative in nature, this one sounds like it could be a little bit more Riley Sager-esque where we don't know if it's going to be speculative or it's not. We are following our main character, Sarah Slade, who is kind of wanting to start over. She is a popular social media influencer and she has recently bought this murder house that was the site of a grisly murder-suicide side and she is determined to fix it up or renovate it. She's going to document the whole process on social media and kind of reach a new audience, kickstart her career back up and kind of distract her from her failing marriage. But as she's starting to renovate it and things, the building itself kind of starts behaving erratically. There are bizarre accidents, mysterious footsteps in the attic. And then on top of that, she starts receiving menacing notes that are appearing everywhere. And Sarah is convinced that there is someone out there that is going to try to kill her and her husband. It says, the more she remodels Blackwood House, House, the angrier it seems to become. Every passing moment, Sarah's life spirals further out of control and with it her sense of reality. Though she desperately clings to the lies she's crafted to conceal her own secrets, Sarah Slade must wonder, was it all worth it or will this house be her final unraveling? So again, I have no idea whether this is going to turn to the speculative or whether it's going to be more like realistic where there is actually somebody behind all of this kind of like Scooby-Doo style. I'm not sure, but I'm actually really very much intrigued by this one and I would be excited to check it out. Again, this is a debut, so we'll see what this author can do. All right, y'all. And as I mentioned, at the very beginning. There are definitely some holiday romances coming out that I'm going to quickly run through. I'm not going to discuss the synopses of this at all, just kind of mentioning the titles and the authors. So we have Faking Christmas by Carrie Winfrey, Three Holidays and a Wedding by Uzma Jalaluddin and Marissa Stapley, The Xmas Holiday by Zoe Allison, Wrapped with a Bow by Lily Vale, and The Christmas Wager by Holly Cassidy. So if you 
are interested in checking out any of these holiday romances, I will be sure to go ahead and link them down below for you to look at the synopsis, the release date and things like that. But we are certainly now in the time of year when all of these are going to start being released. So you might want to start collecting for the holiday season. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I wanted to discuss with you today that are coming out in September. As always, this list is not meant to be comprehensive at all. So if there are some September releases that I did not discuss that you want to mention below, please do so down in the comments to let everyone else know what is coming out. And if you made it to the end of this video, but you are not feeling chatty, let's go ahead and have a ghost emoji left kind of for all the haunted house things we have coming out in the month of September. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week, sometimes two, depending what I could do. And I would sure love to connect with you in one of those next videos or on any of my other social media platforms. I always leave links to my Instagram, Goodreads, and IG threads down below if you would love to chat with me there. And until next time, guys, bye. Thank you.